Hello scholars, this is the professor speaking and I welcome you to Hi, That's Scary, a podcast that utilizes cannabis to analyze horror cinema. The title of today's lecture is Whispers of Queerness Are Louder Than Scream, Part 1. Today we will be discussing Scream, the 1996 meta horror slasher. The film stars Nev Campbell as Sidney Prescott, Courtney Cox as Gail Weathers, David Arquette as Dewey Riley, Skeet Ulrich as Billy Loomis, and Matthew Lillard as Stu Mocker. It was written by Kevin Williamson and directed by Wes Craven. The strain used for this analysis was Ghost Train Haze in a Cartridge. This is a sativa strain that aids in focus and creativity as well as socialization. Let's get to some background about this film. Scream is a film that came when horror as a genre was struggling. The end of the 80s and early 90s was filled with a lot of poor sequels to franchises and just flops in general. Bursting through the wall like the Kool-Aid Man comes Kevin Williamson, who at the time was broke as fuck, with a script called Scary Movie and two outlines for sequels. Miramax buys a script and makes the smartest decision ever by getting Wes Craven to direct. Craven, who for the previous years had been pumping out mostly hits such as Shocker, People Under the Stairs, and New Nightmare, takes the script, puts back in the violence that Miramax tried to cut, and works so well with the cast that we end up with Scream. I cannot count how many times I have seen Scream, but I can say with confidence it has been at least once, if not twice a year, for well over a decade. I know this movie and have analyzed it in my head over and over, so I'm quite excited to spend these next lectures discussing my favorite topics, murder and that gay shit. Without further ado, let's get scary. We open with a red lettered title card accompanied by a screen that is cut off with a phone ringing. The phone is in a very nice house and is answered by Casey Becker, played by Drew Barrymore. The voice on the other line says that they have the wrong number, so Casey hangs up. Phone rings again, same voice, and Casey asks why they called back. They want to talk. Casey dubs that, pulling out a glorious piece of 80s and 90s culture by recommending they call a 900 number instead. For those that don't know, 900 numbers, which apparently still exist, were numbers for paid services like party lines, psychics, and phone sex. Phone sex is the one that's most closely associated with 900 numbers, so Casey doing this is utter savagery, I love it. There's a view of outside which is very green, there's a lot of foliage, and a distinct lack of neighboring homes. Back inside, Casey puts some Jiffy Pop on the stove. Side note, it never pops right, I don't care what anyone says, either half your kernels ain't popping, the kernels themselves individually only half pop, or shit's burnt. Jiffy Pops like Play-Doh, fun to play with, not to eat, and yet still it sits upon Casey's stove. Phone rings again, same voice. Casey decides to humor the person a bit and chats. She starts playing with the knives in the butcher block as they talk. It is here that we get that line. What's your favorite scary movie? Casey responds with Halloween. This is where we start getting the meta. Freddy Krueger, who was created by Wes Craven, is mentioned. The caller ends up asking if Casey has a boyfriend. She says no. They ask her name, and she asks why. The caller says that they want to know who they're looking at. Not even three minutes in, and despite how many times I've seen this movie, I still clench. Casey is shook, understandably, and turns the patio lights on before hanging up. The Jiffy Pop is still popping on the stove when the phone rings again. Casey answers and the caller is already sounding irritated. 
She hangs up. She's about to take the probably burnt Jiffy Pop off the stove when the phone rings again. She answers angrily only to get that energy right back along with a threat to gut her like a fish. Casey starts locking doors, phone in her hand, but still connected to the other line. She tells the caller that she's going to call the police, but remember that shot earlier that showed the absence of neighbors? Casey lives in Carajolen, the boonies, middle of nowhere. She's fucked. She hangs up and cries. The doorbell rings, which scares her, prompting a who's there, and ring, 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 one last time goes the phone. The caller scolds her for saying that because if you know horror, saying who's there is like signing your death certificate. Casey tells the caller to leave her alone, that her boyfriend would be coming. The caller points out that she said she didn't have one, and Casey starts yelling that she lied, that she has a boyfriend who plays American football, and that he'll beat up the caller. Unfortunately, that isn't happening. The caller tells Casey to turn on the patio lights, and there sits her boyfriend, Steve, duct taped to a chair. The caller forces Casey to play a game, otherwise Steve was dying immediately. It's movie trivia, starting with a warm-up question about Halloween, which she gets correct. The second question, the real one, is who is the killer in Friday the 13th? Casey says Jason, which is wrong. She tries to argue with it before the caller reminds her that it was Mrs. Voorhees in the first movie that was the killer. Jason didn't come until the sequels. Steve is gutted as a result. The caller then asks Casey to guess which door they are at. A chair flies through the glass patio sliding doors. Casey runs, going through the kitchen, which is on fire because of the Jiffy Pop, and grabs a knife. She's able to sneak outside. Through the window, she can see someone in a black hooded cloak and a white mask, also known as Ghostface, who is holding a knife in her house. A car is coming down the road. Mr. and Mrs. Becker. Salvation. Casey crawls to keep hidden, which is smart only to pop up at a window that Ghostface is standing directly in front of. The killer jumps through the glass onto Casey. She fights back and manages to get away, only to make the dumbest decision and stop running so she can scream and notify her parents. I don't know why she couldn't have continued to be in motion, but she stood still and it got her tackled. She gets away again, but she's caught, her mouth covered, and stabbed in the shoulder. On the ground, Ghostface strangles Casey, who still has the phone in her hand, by the way, and she knees them in the groin. This is supposed to give the implication that the killer is male because it's assumed this is a nutshot, 90s views on gender, blah blah blah. But as a person without testicles, I can assure those with testicles that it hurts to get need in the groin period. Balls be damned. Casey crawls to the porch and is able to stand as they're walking up. She tries screaming for her mom, but strangulation doesn't just impact airways, it damages vocal cords. Her parents don't hear her and go inside to see the destruction left in Ghostface's wake. The next portion is a bit of back and forth between the Beckers in the house and Casey outside. Ghostface catches Casey, pushes her onto the porch, and begins stabbing her after she pulls off the mask. Inside, her parents are calling for her, and the smoke detector is going off. Mrs. Becker runs in to take the flaming Jiffy Pop off the stove. Cue this portion of the score with heavy, dramatic, utterly heartbreaking violin. She's frantic at this point, and I'm saying it now, huge props to the actors that played her parents, because every time I watch it, I want to cry for her mom. Her daughter is missing, her house in shambles, her kitchen on fire. She's 
terrified. Mr. Becker tells her to call the police, and when she picks up the phone, Casey's on the line. She never hung up. From there, her parents listen to their daughter being dragged in the grass, slowly dying before the phone clicks. Mrs. Becker is practically collapsing in on herself when her husband orders her to drive to the neighbors. She goes outside and is greeted with her daughter hanging from a tree, gutted like a fish. She screams as the camera zooms in on Casey's dead face. Post title card, we're in Sydney Prescott's room. She's in a 90 and working on her computer, which I'm pretty sure is a Mac. This is very clearly establishing Sydney as upper middle class, as she has a computer in her room, not the family room, her own room, that costs over $1,000 in a year that minimum wage was $4.25 while living in one of the most expensive states in the U.S. Scholars, I'm letting y'all know now that all these kids are mostly upper middle class except for possibly Randy because he's the only one with a job. While Sid's typing away on her mortgage payment, she hears a noise at her window. She goes over to check what it was and out pops her boyfriend, Billy Loomis, causing her to scream because he's an asshole and scaring your girlfriend by making her think there's an intruder at the window is shitty. It's not cute and it attracts the attention of her dad. The whole point of sneaking in through a girlfriend's window is the sneak part. So her parents don't know the boyfriend is there. Stupid. Sid's dad Neil comes to the door and Sid uses her closet as an extra lock because of how it catches on the knob. Neil's wondering why she was screaming and Sid is acting shifty as hell. Neil pushes the door fully open and there's no Billy. This man does not go into her room and check to make sure there is not a boy in there and I don't know how that reflects on his parenting skills. I guess it shows that he trusts his kid, which cool, but also his kid just screamed at something. Why didn't he check the room? Anyway, Neil's going on a work thing and will be gone for the next few days. He leaves. Billy holds up one of Sid's teddy bears from the side of her bed, showing how if her dad had just taken a couple steps, they would have been busted, and starts trying to act cute, pretty much. Sid asks why he's there, and he gives the creepiest fucking answer. He was watching The Exorcist, the edited for television version, and when he says this, he describes it as having, quote, all the good stuff taken out. Sir? Does Billy mean the child that sexually mutilates herself with a crucifix as the good stuff? I'm uncomfy. Apparently this made him think of Sid because before her mom died, raped and murdered, but before that, they were more physically intimate on their way to fucking. And now they weren't. What a douchebag. Fuck you, Billy. Billy then requests to just do some over the clothes touchy makeup thing. Sid agrees. A slow version of Don't Fear the Reaper plays in the background, and almost immediately he was trying to push the boundary and go up Sid's nighty. Sid stops him and is rewarded with a, you see what you do to me. Boy, if you don't shut the fuck up, mm. if it wasn't clear before now, I hate him. As he's getting pushed out the window, he tells Sid that he was only half serious, and that works. Sid shows him her boobs. The next morning, there's reporters all over school grounds. Sid's confused until her friend, Tatum Riley, meets up with her and gives her the lowdown on the Casey Steve murder. We get a brief shot of Gail Weathers reporting some exposition about Sid's mom before Sid goes inside. While in class, Sid gets called to the principal's office to be questioned by the police. 
I don't know the laws for 1995-6 California, but nowadays, at least, you still need a parent or guardian there because they are minors. And now a word from our sponsor. But okay. Also, Principal Henry touches Sid's face for some fucking reason. I don't know why it's creepy, but it happens. Cut back to outside. It's the end of the day, and Hembry is giving an announcement telling the students to go directly home from school. This is when we get to see the whole group in all its glory. Billy, Sid, Stumacher, Tatum, and Randy Meeks all sitting at a fountain talking about the police questioning and murders. They're discussing whether or not the killer could be a woman, and Stu insists that it would take a man to commit such carnage. He even goes so far as to actually describe how to gut a person. This is where I'm going to slide in the spoiler of who the killer, rather, killers are. Stu and Billy are the two going around doing the murdering. So here, Stu's insistence on it having to be a man to have killed Casey is basically this protection and affirmation of his masculinity. But why is he being so defensive of his masculinity in the first place? The obvious answer for queer theorists is that Stu's gay. It's been discussed forever on Stu and Billy being queer. A topic that I haven't seen much discussion on is the status of the rest of the Scream characters in terms of being part of the Alphabet Mafia. A quote that I frequently love using is, Queers are like wolves, we travel in packs. Aiden Thomas, Cemetery Boys. Queer folk tend to somehow flock to each other, especially now that things are more socially accepted. There will be the situation where there's a group of friends and maybe one is openly queer or eventually one comes out and it's like dominoes. One by one over the years, more people in the group will realize their queerness. This is not to say that queer people turn people queer or don't have straight friends, as much as it is queer people can be accidental magnets to each other and not or never realize it. And I think that's what we have going on in Scream. Stu's attempt to protect his masculinity is the drop in the water. So keeping that quote in mind, in theory, Stu would have at least a few queer friends. I'm going to sprinkle my opinion on specifics regarding character sexualities, and I'm going to be using textual support while doing so. So to address anyone now before I get accused of grasping at straws, text is defined here as not just the lines but the acting choices, editing choices, and directing choices. I'm putting this disclaimer because for some reason, whenever there's an in-depth discussion about character sexualities, we're expected to have a full bibliography to back us up, but heterosexuals don't. I'm definitely not maybe absolutely salty about that, so I will generally be backing my statements up, but if I just say I think this because I have eyes, I'm gonna need y'all to let me rock. Anyway, all this to say is that this is the first moment of establishing the queerness of the group. After his unrequested tutorial, Sid asks Stu about his having used to date Casey, Randy mentions that she had dumped him for Steve, which Stu denies. Tatum then gives a potential alibi by saying Stu had been with her, and he responds with a lot of physical contact and tone deflection. His touchiness and overall behavior with Tatum comes off as very performative, very much putting on a front. Randy and Tatum talk a little bit before Stu throws in that he didn't kill Casey. Billy basically scolds Stu for this. This scene is where we get to see Randy and Stu's potential ADHD come out, with Randy put him putting on a little voice to ask about organs and mailboxes, and Stu adding on a liver joke that sends Sid walking off clearly uncomfortable. Throughout the scene, Randy's fidgeting and orally stimming with his snacks, Aside from Tatum eating a grape, he's the only one eating throughout the whole moment. Every time I go back to him, he's chewing or swallowing, and that's why I'm including it under oral stimming. 
eating is not inherently oral stimming. <laughs> Impulsivity with Randy blurting out the, with the little voice the way he did. Stu's addition, both of them hyper fixating on the specific act of coming, cutting someone to pieces. Stu ends up trying to defend his joke when Tatum gets mad at him for upsetting Sydney. Sydney goes home, and we find out that she's spending the night at Tatum since Neil's out of town. Tatum calls her and tells her that she'll be picking Sid up at 7 after she gets out of practice. Sid locks the doors and goes to the couch to watch some TV. All the television yields is news discussing Sid's mom. Maureen, and her death, which Cotton Weary, one of her side dudes, was convicted of committing. Tired of hearing about her mom being dead, she turns off the TV and takes a nap. I think she earned that nap, but fuck, that couch did not look comfortable at all. At 7.15, the phone rings, waking her up. It's Tatum out of practice late for regular practice shit. If you've done an extracurricular activity, you know things run late sometimes. She says she's going to stop at the video store before going to Sid's, and they hang up. The phone rings, and Sid answers, thinking it's Tatum. It's not. It's the delivery of the very first Hello, Sydney. Sid thinks it's Randy, and says so. The caller says he's not Randy, but goes on to ask Sid's favorite scary movie. Sid said she doesn't watch horror movies because she thinks they're dumb and insulting to her gender, and you know what? That's fair. It's a big problem in the horror industry, and it very much isolates femme fans. It's gotten better-ish over the years, but we still have a ways to go. Sid mentions the caller being Randy again, and he insists he's not. When asked who he is then, he responds that the question should be where he is, not who. Sid challenges him, throwing open the front door and walking outside. She taunts him a bit and refers to him as Randy before going to end the call. The caller then turns very aggressive, telling her that she'll be killed just like her mother if she hangs up. Sid says fuck you and runs inside, locking the door. Ghostface then pops out of a closet. Shit. He manages to get Sid to the ground and her head just gets smacked on that floor. That shit hurt me. You know she's gonna have to lump the size of Texas from that. She gets hit in the head a lot throughout these movies. You'd think she was a football player with how many times her brain's just been knocked around in her dome. Sid manages to land a good kick and get away. She gets to the door, but the chain is on it and she doesn't have time to undo it, so she runs upstairs. She gets to her room and locks the door as well as opens her closet, so the knob catches. Smart as shit, Sid goes to her computer and uses it to alert the authorities as Ghostface breaks her door lock and tries to wiggle in her room. When she's done typing, she looks over to see Ghostface gone from her door. Backing toward her window, Sid is startled by Billy. He tries to soothe her and she frantically explains what happened. Then a cell phone drops from Billy's pocket. Remember, this is 1996 when cell phones weren't common like they are now. A high schooler with a cell phone wasn't quite normal yet. Like it was getting there. So Sid's freaked out and books it out of there while Billy chases after her. She reaches the front door and opens it to Dewey holding up a ghost face mask. Scaring the shit out of her. Billy's arrested, and Dewey Mirandizes him, but he's doing it poorly, and he doesn't finish, which means that any case against him is already kind of fucked. By not finishing the Miranda, they've technically violated Billy's rights. That is the truth. When arrested in the United States, the arresting officers are supposed to let you know that 
you don't have to talk, but if you do, it can be used in court. You can have an attorney, and if you can't afford one, one will be provided for free, and they can be asked for at any point. Then generally they're supposed to ask if you understand, because that's a whole other legal mess. They just shove Billy in the car and drive away. Inept law enforcement, striking again. I'm so surprised. Sid goes with the police as Gail is pulling up to her house. The car she's in actually passing as Gail tries running up to it. Tatum's walking to her car when Gail tries to stop and talk to her. She drives off yelling at Gail who proceeds to yell at her cameraman, Kenny, for not getting to her fast enough. At the police station, Sid sits at Dewey's desk asking about her father, which the police are attempting to contact. He walks away and Sid sees Billy through the glass wall while he's being interrogated in the other room. Why they allowed him to be able to look at her, I don't know. The sheriff asks why he had a cell phone and Billy uses the everyone's got one excuse that only works with rich kids. Because cell phones were expensive. They still are expensive, but like... It was the 90s. The sheriff then says that while they wait for the phone records to come back, they'd have to hold Billy overnight. He then proclaims his innocence and turns to pout at Sydney through the glass like a baby. While Gail's trying to barge her way into the station, Billy's taken from the sheriff's office to a cell, being walked past Sydney, which doesn't make sense. I can't make it make sense. You don't walk the suspect out in front of the victim. That's stupid. He calls to her as he's taken away. Tatum arrives right on time and insists on taking Sid home, embarrassing Dewey in the process. His voice cracks here and he ends up getting laughed at for being yelled at by his teenage sister. Dewey takes him to a side door so they can avoid the press out front he is an idiot and has them wait outside for him to get the car instead of inside where there's the safety of doors and a wall Gail finds the side door and ambushes Sydney with the rest of the press Tatum tries to shield her best friend of the, in the world okay Tatum's a great friend before Sid puts on this definitely not okay smile and says that it's fine. Sid brings up Gail's book, which is about her mother's murder, and said that she'd need to read it. Gail offers to send her a copy, and that gets her a swift punch in the face. Go, Sydney. I love Gail, and I understand she's an investigative reporter, and she's just doing her job very well, I must say, but she deserved that punch, and she knows it. At Tatum's house, Sid ices her hand while Tatum gushes about the hit. It's kind of like she's in awe of Sid, kind of star eyes, if that makes sense. Mrs. Riley comes into the room saying Sid had a phone call. Thinking it was an update on her father, Sid goes to the phone only to hear Ghostface's voice. He taunts her for having Billy held in jail, fingering the wrong man again, implying that Cotton did not kill her mother. Sid becomes upset, prompting Mrs. Riley to go get Dewey. He arrives too late, the caller had already hung up, and Sydney and Tatum go to bed. That's where we're going to end it today, scholars. Before we finish up, I just wanted to give a quick announcement. I know we just got back from hiatus. Don't worry, we're not about to do another one yet. But we are doing some restructuring at Hi That's Scary. With that, we have decided to move our postings to bi-weekly rather than weekly. I have a project that I need to dedicate extensive time to, and in order to make each lecture for all of you glorious people, I uh, essentially have to write a seven-page paper. That's a single lecture, not all parts. Your professor is trying really hard to avoid burnout, and in order to do that, 
we just need to take a little step back. This means now. This means that now, Hi That's Scary will be releasing every other Tuesday. Tune in on Tuesday, May 11th for Whispers of Queerness Are Louder Than Scream, Part 2. Until then, stay scary.